Hi guys, welcome to a special edition of Ask Ornstein. Frank Lampard was given his marching orders by Chelsea this week, but the writing had been on the wall for some time. I'm joined by The Athletic's Chelsea correspondent Liam Toomey, a man very close to the story, to run through what went wrong for the Blues record goalscorer and why the club have turned to Thomas Tuchel to replace him. If you haven't signed up to The Athletic yet, now is a great time with our special January sales offer of less than £1 or $1 a week. Just go to theathletic.com forward slash ask Ornstein. As always, the site is packed with great content, including our long read telling the inside story of what's going on at Stamford Bridge. So, without further ado. Support for Ask Ornstein is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code ASK, that's A-S-K, at checkout. Okay, well, Liam, thanks for your time. It's a busy week for all of us, so let's get cracking. And here we are again, (laughs) another Chelsea managerial sacking, another Chelsea managerial appointment. I guess I'll start by asking you how it's come to this and and how long it's been coming for. Yeah, so there are two timeframes, really, that matter here. The first timeframe, really, is since last January, um, because that's when tensions first started to build between Lampard and the Chelsea board over a lack of movement in the in the transfer window. Chelsea of course fought to have their transfer ban reduced so they could do business and then they didn't get any business done. Um, Lampard wanted Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang who probably wasn't really available Um, and Hakim Ziyech who of course Chelsea signed a week afterwards Uh, but the the initial seeds of discontent at that at the highest level of the club and that key relationship, I think, were, were sown then. And then we were hearing in August, as features heavily at the start of our piece, that uh, the, pro- the possibility of Lampard being sacked if Chelsea went on a bad run was already being floated, which is amazing when you consider how, how things looked for the club from the outside. Uh, and we also have, you know, someone close to Lampard saying if it was any other club, he might have walked last summer which again is a is a shocking insight into what the dynamics were and how he felt about them and then the other dynamic that matters uh, sorry the other time frame that matters in all of this um is the start of january and the kind of turn of the year and just before we simon johnson and i ran the initial news story uh, that lampard's job was under serious threat because that's when we that's when we really started hearing that conversations about potential replacements for Lampard had intensified. Um, and as we know, those conversations never really stopped in, in the weeks that followed. And, and they've all led to what happened on Monday uh, and, the, and the very swift move to appoint Thomas Tuchel. By the end, it felt that his departure was a case of when rather than if, because of all the uh, situations going on inside the club, on and off the pitch, and and a lot of that information we were hearing, it was clear what trajectory this story was on. However, I might just go off script and out of chronological order here and point out that I was was aware for a long time that Lampard's appointment was not universally popular at the club at the time that he was appointed. There were sections of the hierarchy that did not feel he was the right man to take over. And there were a lot of circumstances around that, most notably the the transfer ban. But you could argue, if you were being extremely harsh about this, that Lampard was always doomed to fail in this job. On the outside looking in, Lampard had advantages that other people didn't have coming into this job. He already knew Roman Abramovich. He already had a relationship with Marina Granovskaya because she was there towards the end of his playing days. He'd been a teammate of Petr Cech for a decade and they'd won everything together. Um, And he was also young enough to, in theory, be able to relate to a lot of the players that he was coaching. Um, So the fact that it still didn't work for him in terms of those key relationships makes you wonder if there's not a broader issue uh, with Chelsea's culture really as a club that they they need to take a long and hard look at now yeah it's been explained to me by somebody who knows Chelsea very well that it's going to take somebody with the perfect blend of tactical genius and a unique sort of accommodating temperament that equally needs to be replicated by the board and ownership a progressive temperament for this ever to work in the long term for a manager and that's 
almost impossible to find. Well, I felt that he did deserve longer. We talked about it on, on this Ask Ornstein video and also some of the podcasts. Um, perhaps the writing was on the wall in the fact that we now know he was given a two-year contract with an option of a third. And um, that means that he will only be paid out until the summer. It was almost as if Chelsea were kind of envisaging this potential scenario and, and planning ahead. And we know when that train leaves the platform at Stamford Bridge, it's very rarely going to be coming back. Um, but Lampard, as you touched upon there, he kind of had a lot of issues to contend with at such an early stage of his career that perhaps very few managers in, in Europe or the world would have been able to contend with the different nationalities, the different um, stages of the careers of the, the various members of the, the squad's egos, um, the power of the Stamford Bridge dressing room, which seems to permeate through generations. Um, but let's get down on those signings uh, and... You know, I've reported that really it was only Ben Chilwell who came in on kind of Lampard say so, and the club backed him on that. But in terms of the likes of um, Thiago Silva, uh, Timo Werner, um, Kai Havertz, Eduard Mem Mendy, these were not sort of proposed by Lampard as far as we know, although he spoke to them, put his seal of approval on it, of course, it accepted it. Similar with Hakim Ziyech, he, he seems to have more of a hand in that. But he wanted Declan Rice, and that was not something the club really backed him on. And it was explained to me that he had to be very careful with that. If he kept pushing for it, it may actually end up costing him his job. So transfers is, is really a key element to this whole story. Transfers being an issue with Chelsea managers, unheard of, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, look, look, this has been a long running theme at, at Chelsea over a number of years that they have this kind of combination, this, this kind of hybrid strategy of pursuing some signings that are manager led um, and then having other signings that are very much long term club targets and you know th th that's clearly the bracket that someone like Kai Havertz who was one of the most coveted young players in Europe someone they'd, they'd scouted for years along with everyone else um, Timo Werner Hakim Ziyech of course we were reported at the time that Chelsea had been monitoring for three years this is all part of the way Chelsea operate recruitment is always a bigger conversation involving their their recruitment structure headed by Scott McLaughlin Mar Marina Granovskaya is in those in, is in those conversations as the negotiator in chief, Petr Cech is now there um, advising in his role. And the manager has a say, but it's not always the deciding say. And of course, Roman Abramovich, probably more than a lot of owners um, and more than maybe some people would, would realize. We have seen over a long period of time, Lampard is not the first Chelsea coach to to run into problems with the hierarchy over recruitment strategy. And I doubt he'll be the last. Frank Lampard knows better than anybody how Chelsea works. And, and I think that's why um, by the end, it, it wouldn't have been a great surprise to him when he received the phone call at around 8 a.m. on Monday. You don't get called to Stamford Bridge around 8 a.m. on a Monday for any reason other than to uh, probably be relieved of your duties. And he was spoken to by Bruce Buck, Marina Granovskaya. It was presumably pretty brief bit of exchange of views on either side and and that was done and and the statements on both sides were were fairly respectful and Roman Abramovich got involved in the Chelsea statement for the first time I think ever um also we pointed out in a piece on the Athletic today about that sort of frantic 24 hours that Chelsea's um supporters were emailed with this sort of statement for the first time ever too so Lampard will know all of this territory but let's drag this inside the dressing room and um highlight a few of the points that we mentioned in our piece, the long read, because um, I spoke to a number of people that made it very clear that Lampard wasn't hated. There was no sort of major animosity towards him personally. You only need to look at some of the social media reaction, which I don't think was really scripted when you when you see Thiago Silva saying things like, as I told you, coach, it felt like I'd been working under you for 10 years. That really strikes me as being very authentic. But there were issues. You talked earlier about the bloated squad, the different personalities, egos, nationality stages of careers. And, and, and crucially on that 
bloated squad, Chelsea didn't manage to get all the, of the players out that they wanted in the summer transfer window. They were left with some pretty influential players on the sidelines, even further back on the fringes. And as we've seen at other clubs too, that is not going to make for a, a pleasant atmosphere. And equally, the sense I've got from speaking to people is just as well as Lampard knows how Chelsea works, those players do as well. So while they felt sorry for him losing his job, it's the nature of the beast at the Blues. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of those social media posts weren't exactly tweet something like they they were they were very <laughs> heartfelt. They were particularly, I think, when you're talking about the the academy players um, and some of the younger players in the squad, the messages seemed really heartfelt. And and you can you can imagine how you know disappointed and 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 uncertain they might be feeling um, now that the manager who was kind of their biggest champion um, in terms of promoting them to the first team has gone. I think, a, you know, a key part of, of Lampard's legacy, which quite possibly, um, knowing what we know, was a, a significant factor in his demise, was the fact that he upended the, the established order of the dressing room last season. He promoted this group of academy boys um, on merit, because largely they justified it consistently on the pitch um, to hit some of his regular starters. And, and, a, and Mason Mount played virtually every single game for him and, and was perhaps Chelsea's most consistent performer during the Lampard era. But when you do that, um, you're promoting them over more experienced players, in some cases, higher earning players. Um, and this season, you're promoting them over big money signings that the club have a lot invested in as well. And I think long term, um, well, of course, it had it's had immediate ramifications, but I think that that causes tensions in a dressing room as well. And it, it feels like within the Chelsea dressing room, there's a little bit of a um, identity crisis right now in, in terms of what this team will become. And I think that's one of the key challenges facing Thomas Tuchel. And, Lampard's legacy will be the money that the likes of Mason Mount, Reese James, Tammy Abraham will save Chelsea in the transfer market in the years to come. Um, but I think he, he might have paid a price for, for giving them that opportunity uh, in terms of the unrest it, it caused elsewhere. We can't let this section pass without mentioning Petr Cech who, despite being a sort of um, director of football type role, uh, you, you'll tell me his exact title, uh, he was training with the first team at one point, despite being part of the hierarchy, almost like the eyes and ears that we've seen at Chelsea with several different personalities uh, over the years. Um, and we now know that he was involved in some conversations with representatives of players who were perhaps having difficult times at the club, Meanwhile, he's a close friend of Lampard and, and on the training pitch with him. That strikes me as being an extraordinary dynamic and potentially something that Thomas Tuchel needs to grapple with go, going forward. Yeah, I think it, it is. A, it was an extraordinary situation. Um, and the first thing to say is that you'll struggle to find someone in football, or at least I haven't yet, who, who has a negative word to say about Petr Cech as a person. Um, but the... The problem is that, as you hinted at, when you look back at the history of the Abramovich era, it's hard to give Chelsea the benefit of the doubt when you see the technical and performance advisor um, training with the first team on a regular basis at a time when the manager is under pressure and under scrutiny. But it's also worth mentioning that everything that Chelsea said publicly about Czech training with the first team and everything that Lampard said even as recently as Friday in his final pre-match press conference ahead of the Luton Town game, was positive about Czech's presence, his experience and, and how Chelsea could make use of it. Well, you mentioned the hierarchy, so let's hone in on that. And the director, Marina Granovskaya, who is really all-powerful at the club when it comes to recruitment, contracts, decisions over managers, staff, players, and... What sort of role would she have played in this? Uh, we kind of got hints of tension back in January of 2020 when Lampard used his news conferences and briefings with newspapers to sort of express frustration at the lack of transfer activity in that window 
Ziyech was not eventually bought in until the well signed until the February and then and then came in the following summer. Um, so was there tension there? And I guess it goes without saying that she is really the key driver in the day-to-day -day business going forward, and she's Roman Abramovich's is trusted uh, right-hand person. Yeah, I remember being in that press conference with Lampard um, on deadline day of, of that January window, and it, it did remind me a little bit of Conte. Um, and, and it was the first time I thought, well, this is interesting, uh, because we hadn't had any hints up to that point that there might be tensions between Lampard and, and the hierarchy. Um, and clearly we know now that that, that that was a sign of something deeper. The relationship with Marina Granovskaya is always the key one for a Chelsea coach to survive in the long term because Roman Abramovich is not there every day. Um, he's not even there some days anymore. He is he is a owner who, you know, runs the club from a distance. He doesn't run it day to day. He entrusts that to Gran Granovskaya on the football side of things. And so all major decisions, all major conversations go through her. Um, and if you if you fall out with her, which again Lampard is 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 not the first person to have tensions um, or disagreements with with, with Granovskaya, um, then it, it doesn't bode well for you in the long term. Even if the final decision to get to get rid of Lampard, as emphasised by Abramovich in his statement, belongs to him and him alone. He he is ultimately the owner and, and takes ultimate responsibility. He trusts Granovskaya's judgment on all issues, including uh, the coach's future. Let's start with the appointment itself and, and what you make of it. Uh, just quickly from a sort of procedural point of view, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain to everyone that I don't know when you'll be watching this, but the plan very quickly after Lampard left was for um, Thomas Tuchel to be appointed within the next 48 hours. Uh, we then bro broke news that he would be flying in from Paris um, on Tuesday afternoon, lunchtime, ahead of hopefully taking training uh, mid-afternoon on, on Tuesday. And with a view to being on the bench for the uh, game against uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers on Wednesday, initially bringing with him three members of staff. I think they've had to go through a pretty rigorous process to um, abide by COVID protocols and also the new work permit conditions uh, post-Brexit. Um, but all seems to have gone to plan and Thomas Tuchel will sign what I believe is an 18-month contract with an option of an extra year that can be activated by either side. Now, on to you and the appointment itself. What do you make of it? It's a very interesting appointment. I, I know you used the words accommodating temperament earlier um, as to one of the attributes that a Chelsea coach would need um, to survive at Chelsea. They're not words that you often hear in in connection with Thomas Tuchel. I mean, he's been described as like a mad genius. You know, I've, I've heard that he he is absolutely brutal with his players, um, but, very, but a lot of his players have only good things to say about him. He's clearly an exceptional coach in terms of what he's able to do on the training pitch and the way he gets his teams playing on the field. But he also has a pretty consistent track record so far of uh, tension with the people above him and a failure to manage upwards is an accusation that has been consistently leveled at him and we you know we've seen this movie quite recently at Chelsea with Antonio Conte um, so in that sense there are immediately red flags uh, with this appointment on, on a political level um, but on a coaching level, I think there's there's reason to believe that, that Tuchel can come in and ha have the kind of immediate impact that Chelsea are certainly hoping he will, and perhaps the kind of you know immediate impact that Jurgen Klopp did when he came in and replaced Brendan Rodgers at Liverpool. Isn't it fascinating this German route that they've gone down on and off the pitch, and you know in terms of a number of their key signings, but also their managerial search. It's, it's never been done by Chelsea before. And, and you mentioned Klopp there. It's clearly a way that Chelsea have been watching and now will be uh, trying to capitalise on. Yeah, well, Chelsea have always had, um, you know, if you were being unkind, you could say they, they, they go with the prevailing winds of what's in fashion in the coaching world. But, I, you know, at the very least, they are very cognizant of 
coaching trends around Europe. And I think, you know, our colleague Raf Honigstein, um, I heard him make the point that Jurgen Klopp has perhaps done for German coaches what Arsene Wenger did for French coaches 20 years ago in that they, they are regarded now as at the forefront of the kind of tactical evolution of the sport um, and the way modern football is played. So it's not a surprise in that sense that Chelsea would have uh, German coaches or coaches of the German school because, of course, we know Ralph Hasenhutl was uh, kind of in the orbit of uh, of the conversation as well. Um, pretty high on their list. You know, we, we ran a piece on the Athletic saying that the next Chelsea coach is likely to speak German. It's not it's not really about language. It's about football language. Um, and, and if Chelsea can bring in, had the option to bring in a coach who they thought would click in terms of his way of working with Havertz, Werner, um, Christian Pulisic, of course, who has worked with Tuchel before. Um, but also, I think quite a few of the, the younger players in this squad, they were always going to do that. And I think in that football sense, they believe that Tuchel is, is a good fit. And clearly they didn't think that the Italian route would click to use your words on on this occasion, because I don't think Max Allegri, despite being available, was was heavily considered. A little bit bruising how it went with Sarri for a large part of his tenure and also the end with uh, Conte, which um, there were some very acrimonious uh, situations at Chelsea at the time. Then you look domestically, Brendan Rodgers has been linked quite heavily, but you wrote a year ago uh, with Simon that uh, this was something that was never going to happen realistically because there was a lot of water under that bridge, a lot of history in in that relationship um, uh, related to when he joined Liverpool and some of his comments there. I've also been told that it would possibly be too expensive to get him out of Leicester. He's on an amazing contract there. He's very close to the tie owners. And there is a feeling in the game that actually if his opportunity comes to leave Leicester, who in their own right are pushing for the Premier League this season and and Champions League football again, then it might actually be eventually for Manchester City. But that's entirely for another day. Of course, this isn't just what the future holds for Chelsea, but Frank Lampard as well. We wish him well with whatever he does. Many managers have come and gone from Chelsea and gone on to better or or successful careers uh, in their own right. So what do you see the future holding for Lampard? You know, I don't think any sacking on your CV is is less of a problem uh, than being sacked by Chelsea. I think it's just accepted as one of those things that inevitably happens. From my perspective, I can't imagine any world in which he doesn't um, continue coaching and that he leaves it on this note because everything we know about Frank Lampard is that he has always been driven by a burning desire to prove people wrong. And, and prove that he is worthy of the, the kind of opportunities that he gets. Um, and, you know, there, there's, there's always been an, an accusation levelled against him from his earliest days at West Ham that he's had things handed to him with a silver spoon and that he's had a leg up in life. Um, and I think that there's always been something deeply unfair about that because what made him Chelsea's greatest ever player primarily was his hard work and his dedication. I don't think he was Chelsea's most talented ever player, but he became their greatest ever player because of his sheer work work ethic and determination to, to reach that point. And I think it will only be even, even more so now. Um, now that he's had his first big disappointment in management, um, he will not want to leave it on this note. And, you know, let, let's not forget, this is a man who, when he didn't get a contract extension from Chelsea, at the end of his playing career, went to Manchester City for a year and for six months actually looked likely, or it actually looked possible that he could help take the title off Chelsea. Um, that that's how that's how much this guy wants to prove um, that he that he is he is worthy of you know the opportunities that he feels he deserves. And I don't think he'll stop until um, he he is he is considered. A, a really high level coach and I don't see any reason why he what he can't get there in the long run. Thanks very much for watching guys and make sure you check out all of the articles and podcasts we've done over the last few days detailing the demise of Lampard and the rise of Thomas Tuchel.
Support for Ask Ornstein is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below the waist grooming. The world is about to get a lot less hairy because you can now buy Manscaped products and finally use the right tools for your family jewels, like the Lawnmower 3.0 electric trimmer with its cutting edge ceramic blade that reduces grooming accidents and keeps you feeling smooth. Its battery lasts up to 90 minutes, so you can even use it for the entire length of a football match. Then comes the Weed Whacker, your essential nose and ear hair trimmer. Both products are part of the Manscaped Performance Package that includes a t-shirt, athletic boxer briefs, deodorant, toner, for, yes, down below, a wash bag to keep it all together, and a newspaper. Why? Well, why not? Happy shaving!